Here's another very fundamental type of problem in computing. Given a function f of x, find a root r of that function. In other words, find a value of r such that f of r is equal to 0. This is the root finding problem. The data to the problem is the function f, and the result is the root r. Because we've got data in the form of a function, and we're going to be perturbing that to look at the condition number, we need some way of measuring the magnitude of a function, similar to what we did with norms. One of the easiest ways of doing that is the infinity norm is just the maximum of the absolute value of f of x over some interval that we pick. So now let's go ahead and perturb the function f to f plus g. Presumably g is small. And then the root is perturbed from r to r plus s, where again s will be small. So we know f of r is equal to 0 by definition. And r plus s is the root of the perturbed function. So we know that f of r plus s plus g of r plus s equals 0. Now we're going to do Taylor expansions on both of these terms for f and g. So we expand around the point r, and we just want the first two terms here because s is small. So all that equals 0. By definition, again, f of r is equal to 0. And when we look at this, this is the product of two small things, so we're going to neglect that. When we do that, we can solve for s. So this is our perturbation to the root in response to the perturbation of the function. So when we talk about a condition number of this problem, we look at the relative change in the root divided by the relative change in the function, which is the data, putting in what we found for s. We get this fraction. If we think about maximizing over all possible perturbations g, then you'll realize that this ratio is always less than or equal to 1, and we could make it 1 in the worst case. So we're left with this expression as our condition number. And there are three factors. The one we're most interested in is this f prime in the denominator. Here I define a function f. Inside the parentheses here, this is the product of x minus 1 times x minus 2. So it's got roots at 1 and 2. Then I wrap that inside the sine function so that it's not just a trivial quadratic function. But wherever the inside is 0, of course, the sine of that is also 0. So this function f has roots at 1 and at 2. So we have them here and here. And as you can see from the graph, the graph is set up so that it's a 1 to 1 aspect ratio on the axes. So the slopes here are roughly plus or minus 1. These are well-conditioned roots. Now f0 is MATLAB's built-in function for root finding. It has a couple different ways of calling it. So here I'm giving it the function f that I want to find the root of. And I'm giving it a starting point to look at. So by starting at 0.75, I'm going to hope that this thing converges to the root at 1. And it did, and in fact, all the digits it found are correct. Here I'm going to call f0 slightly differently. In this case, I'm going to give it an interval where I know that the root lies. So I know that the root 2 lies somewhere in that interval. And again, it finds the root to all digits being accurate. Here I'm changing the function a little bit. Epsilon is a you know, fairly small number. And now this part inside the parentheses here is the product of x minus 1 and x minus the quantity 1 plus ep. So it has two roots that are separated by this amount 10 to the minus 4, fairly close together. Now I'll plot that. And again, I'm using a 1 to 1 aspect ratio on the axes. When you do that, the roots are actually here and here. You're going to have to take my word for it, though, because when I plot at this scale, 
this thing looks completely flat, right? So that's because f prime is on the order of 10 to the minus 4 at those points, which means that the condition number is going to be around 10 to the 4th. And if I ask f0 to find the root that we know is exactly 1, then in fact, yes, it's lost about 4 digits of accuracy in finding that root, all due to the conditioning. Now we find ourselves in a familiar situation. We don't know the error unless we actually know the real solution. So if we get a result, how will we know how good it is? Suppose r hat then is a computed root that's supposed to approximate the real root, which is r. Then we would define the residual as the value of f at r hat. And that is something that we can compute. So what does it tell us about the size of the error? Well, clearly, if it's zero, then that means we got the root exactly. But otherwise, we can define a different function, f hat, by taking the original f and subtracting off this constant value. Now r hat is truly the root of that function, which is a perturbed function from the original. And the size of the perturbation was the residual. So once again, appealing to our idea of backward error, the residual tells us the size of the backward error. So what we're going to hope to do is to make the backward error small and answer nearly the right question, even if we can't get close to the answer because of the large condition number. There's one more thing to consider, and that's a special case of multiple roots. So if you think of the Taylor series expansion of f at a root, it starts with f of r, and then we have a linear term, and then we have a quadratic term, and so on. So we know this first one is 0, because r is a root. That means that if we're close to r, then the most significant term is that linear term. So the function looks like that, unless that term is also 0. If that happens, then the next term becomes the most important term, the largest term. So the function sort of looks quadratic near the root. Unless, of course, that one's also 0. You see where this is going. So this leads to a definition. If the first m derivatives, including the zeroth, are 0 at the root, but the mth derivative of f is not 0, then we call r a root of multiplicity m. The most important thing is when the multiplicity is greater than 1. So if f prime is also 0 at the root, then we know the multiplicity is at least 2, and we also know that our condition number is infinite. But if f prime is non-zero but small, kappa is finite, but it's still very large, so it's a lot like being close to a singular matrix in the linear system problem.